All right. So uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Harrison Bachmeyer. I'm a pharmacist at uh, Moffitt. I've been there now probably about a year. Um, but I've done ID and stewardship down in Fort Myers, also at the University of Kentucky. And uh, this is a presentation I gave uh, a couple months ago about new antibiotics that have been approved, particularly uh, geared towards uh, carbapenem resistant Enterobacteriaceae. So these are just the learning objectives that I'll just uh, go through in the interest of time. So gram negative resistance is not a new problem. We've known about this for a while. And so this is some older data looking back at probably in the, the, the mid and early 1990s, we started seeing a, an increase in resistance among third generation cephalosporins, particularly among Club CL and E. coli. And as you can see over time, this has gradually increased to a point now where we see about 20, sometimes 30% of these isolates being resistant to these commonly used cephalosporins. This has also occurred as well in Pseudomonas and Acinobacter, particularly not only to cephalosporins, but also now to carbapenems. And so our broad spectrum agents are uh, beginning to, to have less efficacy in terms of these problematic organisms. And so when you think about drug resistance, particularly among the gram negatives, we find that it leads to poor outcomes. And so early appropriate antimicrobial therapy is delayed as a result of drug resistance. This leads to increase in prolonged hospitalizations, and unfortunately increases in mortality as well. So in order to mitigate these poor outcomes, we, we're finding ourselves to become more reliant on broad spectrum antimicrobial use more and more upfront early and broader. We're also finding ourselves relying upon combination therapy now, giving multiple agents in order to hopefully have one of these uh, drugs be uh, susceptible to the isolate in question. But as you do that, we do run the risk of increase in adverse effects as we're using more drugs, often older drugs that are more toxic, but also we're now providing additional selective pressure that potentially could lead to increases in resistance. And so it becomes this vicious cycle to where we're rising the rates of resistance and leading to poorer outcomes. So when you look across the world, this is data here through a number of different countries and their incidence of ESBLs throughout the year. And as you can see, as the rate of ESBL is increasing, we find that in earlier times that the mortality related to ESBL infections versus non-ESBL was dramatically different. Much higher mortality rates if you have an ESBL isolate versus non-ESBL isolate. As clinicians become more and more aware of this, we find that as the incidence is increasing, mortality is still statistically different. However, it's a little bit lower because we're giving earlier antibiotic, earlier therapy targeted against ESBLs using broader spectrum agents. So just as a brief review, it's important to recognize there's a number of different beta-lactamases that are out there. ESBLs are, of course, a class A beta-lactamases, but essentially they're derivatives of earlier beta-lactamases that targeted early uh, amino penicillins and cephalosporins. And so as we're using broader agents, ESBLs then developed. And what we found now more recently as a result of increasing uh, cephalosporin use and carbapenem use, we're now developing KPCs, or carbapenem-resistant Enterobacteriaceae uh, carbapenemases, which are known predominantly in the United States as KPC. Now, we also have uh, another beta-lactamase group called beta, uh, Class B. These are metallo-beta-lactamases, largely seen in other parts of the world, but these are becoming very problematic. This is like the New Delhi metallo-beta-lactamases, where we have very limited treatment options available. Class C are essentially your cephalosporinases, or your AMP-C producers. And then class D is a variety of beta-lactamases, mainly found in Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter. So when we look at the outcomes related to CRE, or carbapenem-resistant uh, bacteremia, we find that we have a, a dramatic increase, about 40 to 50% mortality, depending on what study you look at. But throughout the, the past few years, we're seeing a consistently high level of mortality, just as a fact of having uh, carbapenem resistance. So in 2013, the CDC recognized this growing threat of gram-negative resistance and essentially put these organisms on notice where ESBL, Enterobacteriaceae, multidrug-resistant Pseudomonas, and multidrug-resistant Acinobacter are considered serious threats where we have limited options, but we do still have some available. Whereas carbapenem-resistant Enterobacteriaceae is an urgent threat owing to the fact that we have very little options. Although we don't have the numbers that we see with ESBL, the the potential for CREs to, to uh, increase to the rate of how ESBLs have developed is a potential concern why the CDC have isolated and, and focused on CRE as, as, a, uh, as an urgent threat to healthcare providers and patients. So 
The way in which we have addressed uh, drug resistance in the past is simply make new antibiotics. This is a, a viable strategy that has, that has helped us, particularly throughout the 1980s and 90s, where we saw over 10 new antibiotics being brought to market every five years. But as you can see here in this graph, as we're starting to move further and further away, we're seeing less and less antibiotics being brought to market, particularly because of failures in the marketplace, where a lot of drug companies are not incentivized to bring new drugs to market for antibiotics because they're used for a short period of time. There's not a large return on investment. And then what we saw that in the period of 2008 to 2012, only about two new uh, antibiotics were brought to market. So the IDSA and a lot, a lot of other organizations um, had, a, had a campaign known as the 10 by 20. So their strategy was, can we put together uh, strategies and incentives for industry as well as the government to bring 10 new antibiotics by 2020? And so when we look at our traditional treatment strategies, what we have available, the current drugs that we have on the market prior to this increase in approval, we find that there's a lot of, of, of uh, attributes that are very uh, lacking in what our strategies further have. So beta-lactams have been our cornerstone therapy for gram-negative resistance. However, we find that there are clinical failures despite even isolates being considered susceptible. There's a lot of new changes now with CLSI breakpoints. Uh, we're trying to overcome this with novel dosing strategies of extended, uh, extended interval, uh, extended infusion um, administrations, but we still find patients are failing these therapies because of augmented renal clearance, or there's just um, an inoculum effect that potentially is not enough to overcome this. Aminoglycosides still retain a lot of activity against these uh, problematic organisms. However, there's limited utility as monotherapy outside the scope of say maybe a urinary tract infection and there is increase in resistance that has been seen with plasmids that have uh, have been associated with esbls which have now led us to use uh, polymyxins more frequently colistin polymyxin b they still retain a lot of activity but they're very toxic and we really don't know the best way to safely administer these drugs despite them being on the market for over 60 years Tigacycline is very attractive in terms of its spectrum of activity. However, it has suboptimal pharmacokinetics. We find we have inadequate levels within the blood for bacteremia, as well as lung and urine. And we have actually seen resistance develop on therapy as well, and have been associated with poorer outcomes when you're comparing to other comparators. Phosphomycin is uh, fairly attractive. It's only available as an oral option here in the United States, but uh, in Europe, it's used frequently as an IV formulation. It might be approved in the United States shortly as an IV, but we'll wait to see. And so when you collectively look at all of these limited strategies, we find ourselves using a combination, two, three drug combinations from these different groups in hopes of overcoming drug resistance. As a result, we have seen improved outcomes with um, decrease in mortality, though it's marginal and it's often at the cost of increase in adverse effects and uh, particularly poor outcomes in some patients. So as I mentioned before, you know, in terms of drug delivery and drug being, being, uh, having drugs brought to market, we find that as a result of the GAIN Act and the 21st Century Cures Act that was passed by Congress, we've now seen a dramatic increase in new drug approvals, upwards of 12 now in the past six years. <coughs> so going back from 2013 up until now, we have all these new drugs now that are available. I'm only gonna talk about the ones that are in green. These are the ones that target gram negatives whereas the ones in gray are particularly targeted against gram-positives. So ceftolazane, tazobactam, and ceftazidine, avibactam, these have been on the market for some time now. Some of you may already be familiar with their use in, in, in practice, but just as a brief review, ceftolazane, tazobactam, that's the new entity, it's an advanced generation cephalosporin, has a similar structure to ceftazidine, uh, as you can see here in the blue outlined area side chain. However, the gray part is what makes it unique as, as a way to be much more stable against pseudomonas. And so this is kind of its niche area as a, a targeted, highly potent uh, agent for pseudomonas. And then it's also paired with tazobactam, a known beta-lactamase inhibitor, has some activity against um, ESBLs. And so we, you, we've seen this now in practice as a combination. Now, ceftazidine is a well-known third-generation cephalosporin, has activity on its own for pseudomonas. However, when it's paired with avibactam, this is a novel non-beta-lactam beta-lactamase inhibitor. It reversibly inhibits class A and class C, so ESBLs and AMPCs, as well now for the first time inhibiting KPCs. <coughs> 
has limited to no activity against class D beta lactamases. So this is in terms of some Pseudomonas species or particularly Acinetobacter and has no activity against class B. So your metallobeta lactamases are not affected by AV Bactam. When we look at the in vitro susceptibilities of these two agents compare, we find that when you look at gram negatives like E. coli, Klebsiella, both of them have activity. Uh, ceftolozane tazobactam has the ability to improve um, the activity of ceftolozane against some ESBLs, but as you can see, compared to ceftazidine AV Bactam, we see a dramatic decrease in the MICs when AV Bactam is paired, restoring ceftazidine's activity. And this is particularly true against KPCs whereas ceftolozane tazobactam has no activity against KPC. However, when you look at Pseudomonas, we find that in, in a majority of studies that ceftolozane tazobactam seems to be more potent against multidrug resistant Pseudomonas compared to ceftazidine AV bactam, where you see some activity, but it, for the majority of cases, ceftolozane tazobactam is your targeted multidrug resistant Pseudomonas act, uh, agent. There are some, uh, some literature out there that, depending on the geographic region of the institution, uh, ceftazidine AV bactam has proved to be very beneficial in multidrug resistant Pseudomonas. Um, however, so uh, just to keep that in mind as well. When we look at uh, uh, anaerobic uh, activity, because it's paired with the beta-lactamase inhibitor, we find it has some activity, particularly against Bacteroides fragilis. However, it's not across the board what we generally think of, say, Piperacillin tazobactam or other uh, beta-lactamase inhibitors where it seems to have some variability. So we'll talk about this later where additional anaerobic coverage might be necessary in some instances. These are the two trials that brought these agents to market for the indication for complicated urinary tract infections. We have the ASPECT uh, UTI, which uh, looked at ceftolozane tazobactam compared to levofloxacin, essentially found no difference between these two groups in terms of symptom resolution and microbiological response. And this is also similar seen in recapture, where ceft ceftazidine AB bactam was compared to doripenem, and again, finding no difference in terms of clinical outcomes, essentially shown to be non-inferior and effective. The thing to keep in mind is that the ESBL rate in both these trials were pretty low, about 15% in aspect, about 20% in recapture, but did show to be effective in that subpopulation. These two agents are also approved for intra-abdominal infections based on the aspect and reclaim trial group. Ceftolozane tazobactam was compared to mirapenem, found to be no different, very similar in terms of outcomes, upwards of over 80% in terms of clinical cure. And then in reclaimed, ceftazidine AV bactam compared to mirapenem was also shown to be non-inferior. It's important to recognize both these agents were paired with metronidazole to have added anti-anaerobic activity uh, when given empirically. One thing that was unique about these two trial groups is the fact that they found that in patients that had renal dysfunction on randomization did not do as well compared to those that did not. And it's essentially thought of that these patients were potentially underdosed where uh, they came in with renal dysfunction, they were started on a lower dose uh, based on their protocol. And as these patients improved on day two and day three, their doses were not adjusted back up. And as we see, we have a, a decrease in clinical cure rate in this subpopulation. So I think it's important to recognize, you know, as patients are getting better in terms of renal function, we need to maximize their doses that are most tolerable. More recently, we have the REPROVE trial, which showed ceftazidine AV bactam compared to mirapenem for nosocomial and ventilator-associated pneumonia. This was a randomized trial now that has gained indication for this uh, particular disease state where there was no difference, similar outcomes of mirapenem versus ceftazidine AV bactam. And this is also recently shown with ceftolozane tazobactam, very recently now gaining approval for nosocomial infections when it was compared to mirapenem. The thing to really keep in mind is the do dosing strategy with ceftolozane tazobactam. So for the previous trials, urinary tract infections, intra-abdominal infections, it's dosed as 1.5 grams Q8. Now based on PKPD modeling, three grams Q8 of ceftolozane tazobactam is shown to be optimal for treating uh, pneumonia and particularly targeting against pseudomonas. And so here we found no difference between uh, these two agents in terms of ventilator associated pneumonia as well as healthcare associated. Now for more real world data, we've seen that these agents now are being used more and more 
for multi-drug resistant infections. So this is probably the largest case series of ceftolazine tazobactam being used for multi-drug resistant pseudomonas. And if you look on the left here, the patient demographics is a very sick patient population, high morbid, uh, co comorbid con uh, conditions, very high Apache 2 scores, multiple comor uh, comorbid conditions, very resistant pseudomonas species. And we find that in patients who were given ceftolazine tazobactam had an over 73% clinical success rate largely driven by an over 70% mycolog microbiological cure. And this is primarily driven to patients who receive this agent within four days of diagnosis. So early aggressive therapy, targeted therapy in these patients proved to improve clinical outcomes with only about a 19% mortality rate. And they're actually able to identify that in patients who started ceftolazine tazobactam beyond four days had an over five-fold increased risk of mortality. And so again, it, it goes to show about early targeted therapy improves outcomes and delayed therapy potentially can increase mortality. The majority of people also received uh, monotherapy in this group as well, which is interesting. We also now have data. This, is actually, this study was presented uh, last year at ID Week and actually now recently published this week in CID looking at ceftolazine tazobactam compared to polymyxin or aminoglycoside-based therapy for multi-drug resistant or extensively drug resistant pseudomonas. And the main thing to take away is that patients who were given ceftolazine tazobactam had a two-fold higher rate of clinical cure compared to aminoglycoside or colistin-based therapy. And more importantly, had a significant reduction in acute kidney injury as a result of being uh, on ceftolazine tazobactam versus more toxic drugs such as aminoglycoside or polymyxins. And there was no difference in hospital mortality related to these two agents. Moving towards ceftazidine avibactam, this is real world data that's been published now. Um, we have some trial data in solid organ transplant patients where patients who are infected with all types of CRE, when given ceftol uh, ceftazidine avibactam, they had a in hospital mortality of about only 30%. So remembering your baseline is probably 40 or 50%. We're now reducing that now into the 30% range. 65% of patients had a clinical success and 53 had a microbiological success. Probably the largest and most quoted study is by Ryan Shields out of Pittsburgh, looking at carbapenem resistant Klebsiella bacteremia. They looked at those patients who were given ceftazidine, maybe Bactam, compared to other treatments. This is mainly comparing against high dose carbapenems paired with either aminoglycosides or polymyxins. And we find that a 30-day clinical success rate of over 85% in patients given ceftazidine AV Bactam, which is statistically higher than all other groups where we only see about 40% success rate when carbapenems, which are resistant, paired with uh, aminoglycosides or polymyxins. We also have prospective observational trials particularly in the crackle group, looking at ceftazidine AV Bactam versus a colistin-based therapy. Now, the treatment uh, regimens were up to the discretion of the provider, so about 37% of patients were given monotherapy ceftazidine AV Bactam, whereas only 4% monotherapy with colistin. So combination therapy, essentially, versus ceftazidine AV Bactam. Again, very sick patient population, as you can see here on the left. And as you can see, the mortality was significantly reduced with ceftazidine AV Bactam compared to colistin in these patients with um, CRE bacteremia. And we also see a dramatic reduction as well, 5% versus 13% in terms of renal failure. So when you collectively look at this data, the probability of having a better outcome, decrease in mortality, and not having renal failure, patients on ceftazidine AV Bactam of about 64% versus uh, those that receive colistin. So this is just a little bit of review regarding the dosing strategies and considerations. Um, to set an update, so ceftolazine tazobactam is approved for UTIs, intra-abdominal infections, and now nosocomial infections. Um, the dose for UTIs and uh, intra-abdominal infections is 1.5 grams Q8. However, for nosocomial pneumonia, or particularly when you're trying to target multi-drug resistant pseudomonas, if it's being used off-label, really should be targeting a three grams Q8. It's dose adjusted for renal dysfunction, beginning on a creatinine clearance below 50. And ceftazidine is pretty similar. So essentially you're doing the same ceftazidine dose that you would use if it was being used monotherapy. So 2.5 grams is essentially two grams of ceftazidine Q8. Um, and again, 
being adjusted for renal dysfunction. And so when you're thinking about where do these drugs fit into practice, mainly we're using ceftolazine, tazobactam for multidrug resistant pseudomonas infections, whereas ceftazidine, maybe bactam is mainly for KPCs, and also potentially if you identify OXA48 carbapenemases. There has been some discussions in ID circles is, can we potentially use these agents as carbapenem sparing options to limit carbapenem use for ESBLs? It has activity, it has some data, it's not as robust, but when you consider the cost of these agents, a lot of institutions are not utilizing this strategy, particularly because of the cost. There's also been some developments based on the data we've already presented where there is a potential risk for resistance, unfortunately, developing with ceftazidime AV Bactam. We've seen this now in vitro uh, prior to where ceftazidime AV Bactam has caused the induction of resistance, particularly in the KPC3 gene. And it's also now been identified in clinical practice as well with that previous study by Ryan Shields looking at KPC bacteremia. They had a 27% failure rate of patients who were given ceftazidime AV Bactam. And a third of those were identified to having particular resistance to ceftazidime AV Bactam develop only after 10 to 19 days. And so some predictors of failure were those that were given ceftazidime AV Bactam for pneumonia, so more severe infections, and those that were on renal replacement therapy. So pointing out that we might not be uh, optimizing the dose in patients who are on CRRT. Just a comment, we yeah. have a uh, ceftazidime AV Bactam, so Zerbaxo mm -hmm. resistance pseudomonas uh, infection in one of our patients now. Oh, wow. Repeatedly exposed. Yeah, so that's unfortunate that it's only been out for a couple of years and now we're still seeing resistance even Instead developing. Of <laughs> and so we also have data from the Tango 2 trial. That's another CRE trial that allowed ceftazidine and avibactin to be used, and one out of four patients uh, received. Um, this agent in the comparator group, and we found that MIC is increasing on therapy in this group as well. So something to keep in mind. And so when you think about ceftazidine, maybe back then when it first came out, this is our first KPC agent. This is a great addition to our armamentarium. I think a lot of people have kind of pumped the brakes a little bit and knowing that it's not the panacea for you know treating these very difficult infections. Since then, we also have Mirapenem Vapor Bactam approved. This is our first carbapenem beta-lactamase inhibitor combination that's approved. We all know miropenem is a broad spectrum, very stable agent against ESBLs and AMCs. And now Vaberbactam is a first in a class, structurally different boronic acid um, beta-lactamase inhibitor, very potent agent. It reversibly binds to beta-lactamases and has a very prolonged interaction with the enzyme. And so it inhibits on its own class A and class C, which miropenem does it in itself, but it now also has excellent activity against KPCs. Uh, but again, like AV Bactam, does not have any activity against class B, so no activity against the uh, New Delhi metallobeta-lactamases or VIMS or class D oxa uh, uh, beta-lactamases. But when you look at the difference that Vabobactam uh, adds to miropenem susceptibility here, this is a number of different Enterobacteriaceae species here where we find that uh, in agents and in, in isolates that are carbapenem resistant, when you have MICs over 32, 64, 128, we see a dramatic reduction, 64 to a, over 100 fold reduction in miropenem's MIC when vapor bactam is added to this combination. Interestingly, though, when you look at pseudomonas, for carbapenem resistant pseudomonas, unfortunately, vapor bactam really does not <laughs> add any additional activity. Um, it doesn't restore any activity to miropenem, and this is similar to uh, Acinetobacter as well. One thing that's really good with this combination is that Vaberbactam pretty much shares the exact same pharmacokinetics as miropenem. And so when you look at serum drug concentrations, uh, lung concentrations, we find that the, the Cmax and the serum concentrations are pretty much very closely mirrored. And also the clearance is very similar as well. And so they pair each other remarkably well. And also when you look at what are ways that we can maximize drug delivery and drug exposure for beta-lactams, essentially giving them as high dose extended intervals. And so miropenem from the very beginning or vaberbactam miropenem was studied as a high dose, two grams of miropenem, two grams of vaberbactam every eight hours as a three hour infusion. So this is the, the, the 
premier study that brought it to market, Tango One. This was a phase three randomized control, randomized control trial uh, for urinary tract infections compared to Piperacillin and Tazobactam. Um, and they were able then to be treated for anywhere from five days upwards of 10 days. And so the primary endpoint was overall success at this time point. And we find that Mirapenem Vaporbactam was actually shown to meet superiority over Piperacillin and Tazobactam in which it was gained approval both in the United States and in Europe. However, very few, there were very few ESBLs, no KPC uh, isolates in that trial, and so which brought them to the Tango 2 trial. This is a very pivotal, multi-center, international phase three randomized control trial, specifically looking at, for the first time, uh, a targeted KPC CRE drug to be used in CRE type infections. And so it was very difficult to uh, design a trial so what are you going to use as a comparator? So they allowed that, well, we really you know, are using pretty much anything we can try. And so they allowed for what was called this best available therapy. And so this is monotherapy, uh, tigacycline, monotherapy, colistin, dual combination therapy, even allowing for triple therapy. Anything that you can think of, you can use and compare it now to mirapenem vaporbactam and very sick patient populations. They included urinary tract infections, intra-abdominal, pneumonia, bacteremias. And what we find is that mirapenem varibactam significantly reduced um, mortality. It increased clinical cure rates and overall patients did better on mirapenem varibactam compared to whatever else uh, combination therapy you can think of. And there was also significantly lower uh, treatment related adverse effects, particularly uh, significant uh, acute kidney injuries and, and renal failure because the comparator group often included colistin, aminoglycosides, much toxic drugs. This is the dosing recommendations for renal dysfunction. Thing to keep in mind is that when you're looking at references, so, you know, they're talking about four grams of mirapenem vaporbactam. That's two grams of mirapenem, two grams of vaporbactam. And essentially it models what we're dosing mirapenem for very high uh, doses, very aggressive dosing. Thing to keep in mind that their renal do dosing adjustments are actually based on the MDRD equation, not the Cockcroft Gulf. So it's something different versus other uh, antibiotics. And then other things to keep in mind is that carbapenems in themselves are not very stable at room temperature. So about four hours or so. And so when you're considering a three hour infusion, you have about a one hour uh, kind of leeway from getting the drug mixed to getting it to the patient and being infused. Next, uh, within the past year, we have now our second carbapenem, carbapenemase uh, uh, inhibitor. This is imipenem, still paired with psilostatin, as well as now relabactam. So everyone knows imipenem, uh, psilostatin combination has been out for a long time. Activity against ESBLs and AMPC, as well as pseudomonas. But now relabactam is our non-beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor. Very structurally similar to avibactam, and as a result, has similar activity against KPCs and some OXA 48s. But again, no activity against class D, no activity against class B beta lactamases. This is some in vitro micro data here showing that in the first column here at the top are wild type, pretty much all isolates, where we find that uh, imipenem uh, relabactam uh, versus imipenem by itself, where the MICs are for, say, Klebsiella, Enterobacter, and then Pseudomonas. But when we have imipenem resistant Klebsiella right here on the bottom part, or imipenem resistant Enterobacter, we find that the MICs stay um, below the breakpoint of about two versus where we see an MIC creep with imipenem itself. So Relobacterium restores activity for uh, Enterobacter ACA, as well as for the first time now seeing improvements in Pseudomonas activity as well. We're at the bottom graph here on the right, we see as imipenem resistant pseudomonas, we see an increase in MICs. Relobactam actually able to uh, inhibit a lot of the AMPC production that pseudomonas produces. And imipenem has the ability to be stable against some efflux pumps. And so we find that collectively we are restoring imipenem's activity versus imipenem alone. So this is the phase two trial that was uh, presented to the FDA for approval. On the left here is some in vitro data showing that in the presence of relobactam, KPCs, and um, multidrug resistant pseudomonas, we have MICs that were very low. And when imipenem is dosed at 500 milligrams over 30 minutes for every six hours, we find that we are hitting our PKPD target 
although this is a little bit on the low side, 30% time above the MIC, but at roughly the majority of these isolates are above the target of 90% target attainment. And then here on the right, these are the two phase two trials that were presented to the FDA for urinary tract infection and complicated intra-abdominal infections, where imipenem relibactam was compared to imipenem itself. However, there were very few, if there were no, actually no KPCs, very little ESBLs in these groups. And so essentially this is a, a safety uh, trial in which we find it is just as good as imipenem itself, but we wouldn't expect it to be any different with very little resistance. However, the Restore ME1 trial was recently published in Clinical uh, Infectious Disease. Now this is imipenem relibactam's carbapenem resistant phase three randomized control trial in which they were comparing imipenem plus colistin versus imipenem relibactam. Uh, patients were given um, this for uh, urinary tract infections, intra-abdominal infections, and pneumonia. And so they had to be at least on five days of therapy for UTIs and at least seven days for hospital-acquired pneumonia, upwards of, of 21 days. And so they looked at favorable outcomes depending on the indication. So it's important to recognize HAP and VAP have a favorable outcome of 28-day all-cause mortality. Intra-abdominal infection is day 28 clinical response. And then UTI is a clinical and microbiological response at the end of your follow-up. So this is FDA wording in terms of what brings things to market. So when you look at the um, outcomes here, the demographics here on the left, we see the majority of these patients had ventilator associated pneumonia as well as urinary tract infections, very little intra-abdominal infections. And thing to keep in mind that, you know, this is a carbapenem resistant, you know, KPC directed drug. However, there was no, virtually hardly any KPC and the carbapenem resistant isolates were mainly pseudomonas. So it's something that's interesting, a lot different than say what we saw in Tango 2. But when you look at comparisons for HAP and uh, urinary tract infection, we find that there is very similar outcomes related to imipenem relibactam as well versus imipenem colistin. But the major takeaway point is that we see a significant reduction in treatment emergent nephrotoxicity. So imipenem relibactam significantly less rates of nephrotoxicity versus imipenem plus colistin. This is the package insert dosing recommendations. Again, keep in mind, you know, it's recommended for patients with normal renal function, 1.25 grams uh, every six hours. Essentially, this is 500 milligrams of imipenem, 500 milligrams of psilostatin, and then 250 milligrams of relibactam. And then your dose adjusting, essentially lowering the dose, but keeping your interval Q6 as you're decreasing renal function. Again, uh, imipenem stability is even less than miripenem, so it's only stable for about two hours at room temperature. This is why it's potentially difficult to be given as an extended infusion and why it's given very frequently every six hours. Important to recognize also imipenem in itself, as well as with this combination, we see an increased risk of seizures with uh, gangcyclovir. And of course, it's almost impossible to have therapeutic drug concentrations of valproic acid with carbapenems, and imipenem is no different. And so often it's avoid, uh, should be avoided with this combination. Next, we're gonna move into plasomycin. This is a new aminoglycoside that's been approved, very similar to other known aminoglycosides. And in terms of its mechanism of action, it uh, inhibits uh, protein synthesis, very concentration dependent activity, um, activity against ESBLs, as well as even carbapenem resistant Enterobacter ACA. But it has limited activity um, against Pseudomonas, Acinobacter, and Stenotrophomonas. Some, but, but nothing really in terms of multi-drug resistant, aminoglycoside resistant isolates. This is some in vitro activity looking at plasomycin in uh, the blue, and then genomycin and amicacin to where, you know, wild type Enterobacter ACAs, we see them all pretty much the same. However, as you're increasing the amount of aminoglycoside modifying enzymes, we're seeing the MICs of genomycin and amicacin increase, whereas plasomycin stays very uh, susceptible. This is mainly because it's structurally configured to resist multiple aminoglycoside modifying enzymes. However, when you look at the activity against pseudomonas with uh, aminoglycoside modifying enzymes, here on the left we see um, pretty much wild type where we have some activity, but no, no better than what we see with amicacin and genomycin. 
And as we're starting to increase the number of aminoglycoside modifying enzymes, we're seeing the MIC of plasmomycin increase along with genomycin and amikacin. So real, no real benefit in that group. Some of the trial data related to plasmomycin, this is the one that brought it to market. This is the EPIC trial looking at complicated urinary tract infections compared to miropenem with the allowance for step-down therapy of levofloxacin after uh, five days or so. And so we're looking at composite, uh, composite cure at day five, as well as a test of cure later on two weeks after therapy. And what we find here is that the majority of patients, we had a, a pretty good representation between complicated urinary tract infections and pyelonephritis. There was an even distribution of, nephro, of, of renal dysfunction between the two groups. And we find really no difference in terms of clinical outcomes in terms of composite endpoints with plasmomycin compared to miropenem overall. Um, with there was at the test of cure visit, uh, numerically higher patients with plasmomycin reaching um, composite cure or retaining cure versus miropenem. And a lot of people have recognized or maybe pointed to, well, there was a unique observation in that plasmomycin was associated with a significantly higher pathogen eradication throughout the study compared to miropenem itself. And this is across the board, depending on if Enterobacteriaceae, ESBL versus non-ESBL, as well as other isolates as well. And when you look at this collectively, we find that there was a, um, a much lower clinical relapse rate with plasmomycin compared to miropenem at the end of study, which is pretty interesting. In terms of adverse effects, we did see numerically higher serum, inc serum creatinine increases with plasmomycin. However, this wasn't really uh, during the time that they were on therapy, as you can see here, 3.7% versus only 3%. This is mainly seen after therapy uh, was stopped. So there might be a potential delay in increases in serum cre uh, creatinine with plasmomycin. However, it's important to recognize that 90% of patients who developed an increase in serum creatinine had renal dysfunction on baseline. Unfortunately, no patient, hardly any patient had any increase in serum creatinine above one or, or a magnitude of one. So it's approved for urinary tract infections. It's recommended uh, to be dosed at 15 mg per kg Q24 with dose adjustments of, Q, uh, of 10 milligrams Q24 and then Q48 for renal dysfunction. There is recommendations for therapeutic drug monitoring. We're targeting troughs of less than three. Um, and then dose adjustments based on the type of uh, trough that you get. And then finally, the CARE study was looking at uh, more severe infections, uh, CRE type infections, uh, bloodstream infections, and a hospital acquired uh, pneumonia. Uh, but remember, this was a combination um, regimen. So plasmomycin plus miropenem or tigacycline versus colistin plus miropenem or tigacycline. And so a very difficult study to conduct. Um, interestingly, they were actually targeting AUCs, not troughs, so being more aggressive with their targeting. Uh, and when we look at the, the outcomes associated with this uh, trial, we find that numerically there was uh, much um, um, lower uh, failure rates and, and mortality. So it looks like better outcomes with plasmomycin versus colistin. However, it didn't meet the FDA standards for indication. And so uh, failed to, 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 to have this. But overall, looking at this trial looks to be much more attractive than a colistin-based therapy uh, for this type of infection. And again, looking at adverse effects, colistin-based therapy has increase in nephrotoxicity compared to aminoglycoside plasmomycin. And then finally, we're gonna end with aravacycline. So this is a um, synthetic, structurally similar tigacycline type molecule. Uh, basically works the same way by preventing protein synthesis, very broad spectrum of activity, inhibiting gram negatives, ESBL, CREs, as well as MRSA and VRE like tigacycline does. And it was being developed as an IV formulation and PO, but that's kind of stopped based on some of the data I'm gonna present here. So this is looking at in vitro data, looking at a number of different gram negatives, including those that are ESBLs and CREs, very potent activity. It's about two to eight times more potent than tigacycline is. Um, and so it looks to be very attractive in terms of a broad spectrum activity, and as well as those in terms of anaerobic uh, pathogens as well, even being more potent than tigacycline in this realm as well. And so we all know that tigacycline's pharmacokinetics are not the best, very not ideal for a lot of infections. And so when you look at a comparison of the ravacycline, 
it's better, but no, you know, not you know, over surmounting better. So we do have um, uh, the volume of distribution is a little lower, and so its serum drug concentrations are a bit higher. However, you know, not markedly higher than what tigacycline is, but enough probably to overcome the MIC maybe in some instances. Uh, similar half-lives, um, so dose similarly, very little renal drug elimination, only about 20%, and so its utility for urinary tract infections is, is, is questionable. And so we have data that's brought to market based on the IGNITE trial group. This is IGNITE 1 and 4. Aravacycline being compared to ertapenem and then mirapenem for complicated intra-abdominal infections. Very little resistance in these, uh, in these cohorts related to ESBL and acinetobacter. But comparatively for carbapenem use, uh, compared to carbapenem use, we have over 80%, almost 90% clinical cure rates in both, these age, in both these trial groups. And so it's been approved for intra-abdominal infections. In terms of adverse effects, uh, it does carry higher adverse effects as you would expect. How tigacycline has increases in nausea, vomiting. Um, we do see that also with aravacycline. It may not be as high as what we see with tigacycline, but still more than other comparators. And then finally, in the IGNITE 2 and IGNITE 3 trial group, they were looking at a potential uh, indication for a complicated urinary tract infection, as well as an option to step down to oral aravacycline. And so this was being compared to levofloxacin and aravis, uh, in, in ertapenem. However, in both these trials, um, the clinical cure rate failed to meet its non-inferiority margin of 10% of difference. And so it was larger than that in its 95% confidence interval. And so both these trials were stopped due to failure to meet uh, their endpoint. And, and pretty much this drug is going to be scrapped for an indication for a UTI. So this is just a, a summary to, to look at, you know, where all these drugs fit into practice. And we have our cephalosporin beta-lactamase inhibitors, where Zerbaxa seems to be our primary drug for carbapenem-resistant pseudomonas. Avicaz or ceftazidime avibactam is our KPC agent. Maybe you can argue ESBL spare, uh, carbapenem sparing for ESBL, similar to Zerbaxa. Um, whereas uh, Vabramir or carbapenem, uh, mirapenem vaporbactam, particularly against CREs, and I would even argue probably against KPC3, uh, more so than ceftazidime avibactam because of that concern for de of resistance developing. Uh, Recarbrio is our imipenem relibactam. It's not really clear where this is going to fit into practice. We don't have a lot of data against KPCs. Uh, it looks okay for multidrug resistant pseudomonas, so maybe, but you know, in terms of cost, we don't know where that's going to be now when you think of Zerbaxa being probably the most economical for um, multidrug resistant pseudomonas. Uh, Zemdri or plazomycin uh, has activity against CREs. It's our only once a day drug, so th this might be something that's attractive for outpatient utilization for. A complicated urinary tract infections, maybe bacteremia, still let to be seen. I don't think a lot of places have adopted this strategy yet. And then aravacycline maybe has activity against multidrug resistant acinetobacter, CRE, so maybe multidrug resistant polymicrobial intra-abdominal infections might be the place for this agent. It is priced pretty attractively compared to the other uh, CRE drugs, and so we'll see where that falls into practice as well. And then I'll just leave you with, there's more to come within this realm uh, uh, next month. I think a lot of people are waiting for, for the FDA to review cefiterocol. Um, this is a really unique uh, cephalosporin that's formulated as a citophor, which basically works by uh, tricking bacteria and thinking that the drug molecule is iron. And so it evades all, all uh, porin and efflux pump pumps and essentially the, the bacteria is bringing in more and more of this drug thinking it's iron to try to grow and then so it's structurally related to cefepime and ceftaz so very stable against AMCs um, but uh, it's also stable against class um, D as well as multidrug resistant acinetobacter now for the first time, multidrug resistant stenotrophomonas, multidrug resistant burkholderia so essentially the gorilla psyllin for all drug resistance among gram negatives and so it's we'll, we'll wait to see what the fda says but there are already some data showing it's not inferior to imipenem for uh, utis and it has ongoing trials for cre versus best available therapy as well as pneumonia so we'll see next month uh, if this gets brought to market